this, speaking to us this morning is Dr. Michael Federici. He is professor and, uh, professor and chair of the Department of Political Science and International Relations at Middle Tennessee State University. He received his BS in economics from Elizabethtown College and his MA and PhD in politics from the Catholic University of America. He is the former president of the Academy of Philosophy and Letters and the author of three books and editor of three volumes, including Eric Vogelin, The Search for Order, and The Catholic Writings of Orestes Bronson. Today, Dr. Federici will be speaking on history, abstraction, and the problem of ideology. Dr. Federici. Thank you, James. And thank you to Jeff Nelson for his kind invitation to come to Williamsburg, one of my favorite places in the whole country, to speak. And thank you to Emily for arranging to get me here. Uh, this is a wonderful idea for a conference. It's a wonderful place for a conference. And I very much look forward to meeting many of you students and to talk about history. My task this morning is to probably introduce some of you to the ideas of Eric Vogelin. And I'm not going to spend much time telling you who Vogelin was, other than to say that he was born in Germany, moved as a young boy to Austria. He was forced out of Austria as a young scholar in his early 20s by the Nazis when he was investigated by the Gestapo. He escaped through Switzerland, came eventually to the United States, and spent most of his academic career at Louisiana State University. He did go back to Germany for a short period of time after the war and then finished his career at Stanford. But his scholarship is colored by his experience with totalitarianism in the 20th century and his personal flight from totalitarianism. Second thing I'm going to say is the best part of these talks is actually when you ask questions. So I'm going to go as quickly as I can, but even doing that, I don't want you to hesitate to stop me at any point as if we were in the classroom if I say something that requires more clarification. Just raise your hand and we'll see what we can do about that. Okay. Eric Vogelin begins the new science of politics by stating that the existence of man in political society is historical existence. In this succinct statement, much is suggested. It may seem obvious that human existence is historical. What else could it be if not historical? Yet Vogelin would not state such an obvious point unless it was not obvious to everyone. The point is necessary because Vogelin's political theory and conservative thinking generally competes with a historical thinking that can be classified as idealistic, romantic, progressive, and utopian, types of political thinking that are escapist. They are escapist because they aim to overcome the limits and boundaries of historical existence. That is to say, some thinkers are so displeased with historical life that they attempt to leap out of the constitution of being, to invent in imagination and reason what Vogelin calls second reality, a pseudo reality that has been portrayed by thinkers such as Karl Marx, Edward Bellamy, and Auguste Comte, as well as social contract thinkers like Thomas Hobbes and Jean-Jacques Rousseau. A word of caution is required to avoid leaving you confused about Vogelin's point regarding historical life and dissatisfaction. Human beings have good reason to be dissatisfied with historical existence. Life is difficult. A typical human life is met with a range of challenges and disappointments that include illness, crime, natural disasters, aging, death of loved ones, economic crisis, boredom, injustice, 
betrayal, innocent suffering, to name a few. I'm not competing with Augustine here, who in the city of God goes on for pages with many, many, many more things. It would be odd for humans to experience their share of such challenges and not want more from life. It is human to seek delivery from life's most existentially distressing episodes. Yet there is a difference between coping with historical life with dignity and grace and revolting against it by attempting to change the very structure of reality. As I refer to Vogelin's terminology, in particular, first and second reality, it may be helpful to think of George Orwell's 1984. Winston Smith is aware that the state, Big Brother, goes to great lengths to create a false conception of reality that is used to establish totalitarian control of the population. Winston's decision to resist the tyranny of Big Brother is inspired in part by his ability to maintain historical imagination and historical consciousness to see life for what it is. He knows that life can be and has been different than dehumanizing totalitarian oppression. History provides a standard against which Winston can measure the claims made by Big Brother. Something similar is going on in Huxley's Brave New World. John the Savage has not been conditioned by genetic engineering, psychological conditioning, soma, or social organization. He maintains contact with his humanity because his experience with family, community, and literature, such as they are on the reservation, attune him to the search for order in his soul. Like Winston Smith, John the Savage refuses to participate in dehumanizing the population. He is willing to live with pain and suffering as the price for his humanity. I will break my presentation into three parts. Part one, why does history matter? Part two, why is a historical abstraction problematical? And three, what are the prospects for a restoration of historical scholarship and an historically based politics? So first, why does history matter? Human existence, as Vogelin notes, is historical existence. We exist in time and in what Vogelin, following Plato, calls the metaxi, the permanent structure of existence. Metaxic life is a tension and in between. Humans exist in tension between good and evil. They desire to know the meaning of their existence, to know divine reality, but they are beset with contrary desires, including the will to power, lust for fame and fortune, and pleasures that are inconsistent with the good life. To say that there is something permanent about historical existence does not, of course, mean that change is impossible. Things change. The structure of reality does not. There are limits to the possibilities of historical life because humans are bound by their nature and bound by the human condition. Metaxic existence includes a range that means that humans are less than gods and more than beasts. In Judeo-Christian thinking, humans suffer from original sin. They and the societies they live in are imperfect and imperfectible. History then serves to ground human existence, to orient it to reality. History also provides a record of the human struggle to understand the human condition and to achieve the highest aspirations of civilization, the true, the good, the beautiful, and happiness. While human understanding of truth, the good, and beautiful are imperfect, what can be known is found in the substance of human experience, in the drama of historical life. In Vogelin's view, 
Man's relationship to divine reality is, the central, is central to the meaning and purpose of human existence and the quest for justice and order. Truth about human existence, however, cannot be captured, according to Vogelin, in dogma or doctrine. Reality cannot be reified without distorting its historical texture. Ideology reifies truth because it closes off the search for truth and claims to embody final answers. Tradition, rightly understood, maintains the philosophical texture of historical truth because it does not claim to be the final and complete truth. It is an approximation of the true, the good, and the beautiful that requires reformulation and reconstitution. Vogelin is not alone in his view that ideological reification is destructive to genuine human understanding. Edmund Burke, Irving Babbitt, and Russell Kirk make similar arguments about tradition and reconstitution. Kirk learned from Burke and Babbitt that preservation of a tradition requires change and reform that maintain continuity with the nation's cultural heritage. In Kirk's words, with civilization as with the human body, conservation and renewal are possible only if healthful change and reinvigoration occur from age to age. Tradition should never become stale, brittle, or antiquated, nor should it be blindly followed. Beyond the reach of careful re-examination, by temperate minds, guided by moral imagination, and individuals of character, it must be continually refined and adapted to meet the challenges of changing circumstances. It must be reformed when its inadequacies become evident in new historical light. In this process of refinement and renewal, new and old are synthesized in a way that allows old insights and principles in reconstituted form to serve as a living force in new circumstances. Preservation of tradition and the historical experience that gave it life then are not as simple as mere imitation. Tradition is dynamic. From one historical epoch to the next, it ceases to be identical to what it was in the past. As Burke notes, in what we improve, we are never wholly new. In what we retain, we are never wholly obsolete. Although it changes and adapts to meet new circumstances, it main maintains continuity with its engendering spirit. Change and adaptation are necessary to preserve tradition because the vagaries of historical existence require adjustments to unforeseen developments in human existence. As Vogelin notes, the very historicity of human existence, the unfolding of the typical in meaningful concreteness precludes a valid reformulation of principles through a return to a former concreteness. What allows for the reconstitution of old insights and principles is a return to the consciousness of principles, not a return to the specific content of an earlier attempt. Babbitt emphasizes a certain orientation of character and imagination as necessary for the reconstitution and realization of the good. Both Vogelin and Babbitt reject the notion that the true, the good, and the beautiful can be reified into dogma and doctrine or particular form. Individuals of higher character and imagination are equipped to grapple with the problem of the one and the many, universality and particularity. They see universality not as a stale, uniform reality, but in Babbitt's words, a oneness that is always changing. The truth of reality can be conveyed in different forms, including philosophy, revelation, myth, allegory, and fiction. While humans cannot know reality perfectly, they can understand it to varying degrees. Moreover, insight is gained by 
a right use of illusion or imagination. In his introduction to Ray, Bad Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451, Neil Gaiman remarks, quote, that fiction is a lie that tells us true things over and over. It transmits ideas and experiences through generations. It allows us to empathize with human beings who face both similar and different circumstances than our own. Fiction broadens our experiential horizon in a way that provides a better sense of what it means to be human than can be grasped from one's limited individual experience. Fiction compels its readers to use their imaginations to consider the plight of its characters, and in doing so, to consider possibilities that may not have occurred to the reader. Examples of how fiction can illuminate the truth of reality will help to illustrate the point about human understanding and the human condition. In Arthur Kessler's Darkness at Noon, Nicholas Salmanovich Rubashov has been imprisoned by the Stalinist leaders of the regime for political crimes against the state. He is a party official who represents the Leninist revolutionary generation of leaders responsible for the early establishment of a totalitarian dictatorship. While in prison, Rubashov reflects on his behavior as a high party official over the course of 20 years, and from his inverted position, he begins to see the inhumanity of the revolution and its ideology that helped create it. His encounters with other prisoners and his interrogators compel him to question the morality of his behavior as a party leader that tended to subvert all things to the political. When he was in power, the end of culminating the revolution justified any and all necessary means. As he watches a fellow prisoner, Bagrov, be dragged down the hallway, beaten and close to death, Bagrov cries out Rubashov's name as an act of solidarity and respect. Rubashov then imagines that when he betrayed his lover, Arlova, Arlova, to the party, she too was tortured and dehumanized. The experience causes Rubashov to consider that what he previously believed to be the moral imperative of the revolution was in reality a delusion, a figment of an imagination corrupted by romantic political inclinations. He is beginning to see life in a new light. Kessler captures Rubashov's shifting intuitions. Up till now, he had never imagined Arlova's death in such detail. It had always been for him an abstract occurrence. It had left him with a feeling of strong uneasiness, but he had never doubted the logical tightness of his behavior. Now in the nausea which turned his stomach and drove the wet perspiration from his forehead, his past mode of thought seemed lunacy. The whimpering of Bagrov unbalanced the logical equation. Up till now, Orlova had been a factor in this equation, a small factor compared to what was at stake. But the equation no longer stood. The vision of Orlova's legs in their high-heeled shoes trailing along the corridor upset the mathematical equilibrium. The important factor had grown to the immeasurable, the absolute. Bogrov's whining the inhumane sound of the voice which had called out his name filled his ears. They smothered the thin voice of reason, covered it as the surf covers the gurgling of the drowning. The experience of Bogrov's dying words causes Rubashov to imagine himself, the revolution, and his moral standing. His vision of Orlova being dragged down a corridor is the product of his imagination, a fiction that crystallizes for him the meaning of his character and its moral shortcomings. 
The concrete images of his imagination compel him to move away from his old conception of life and toward a developing and contrasting view of reality. He is beginning to realize that the revolution was a farce and that something perhaps transcendent is now part of his consciousness and commands his searching attention, if not his obedience. Rubashoff now understands that the suffering caused by the revolution can only be justified if one spoke in the abstract of mankind. But applied to man in the singular, the real human being of bone and flesh and blood and skin, the principle, the abolition of senseless suffering led to absurdity. He writes in his diary, we have, over th we have thrown overboard all conventions. Our sole guiding principle is that of consequent logic. We are sailing without ethical ballast. Perhaps the heart of the evil lay there. Perhaps it did not sit mankind to sail without ballast. And perhaps reason alone was a defective compass which led one on such a winding, twisted course that the goal finally disappeared in the mist. Rubashoff reflects on his past and remembers songs, the folded hands of the Pieta. In the tumult of death, he reaches a state of consciousness akin to ecstasy of the mystics and contemplation of the saints. With it comes the oceanic sense of being part of a larger reality in which the metaphysical became real. He is discovering what Babbitt refers to as the ethical center. And with it, he exhibits, in Babbitt's words, intensity on a background of calm. So that in the moment of death, he experiences a shrug of eternity. Rubashoff's conversion stems from his reaction to an experience, a reaction that is in no way inevitable. Just as Augustine chooses to steal pears, but could have chosen otherwise, Rubashoff could have easily continued to embrace his distorted view of reality inspired by romantic imagination and avoided the existential anguish that marks the turn in his consciousness. Albert Camus' character Jean-Baptiste Jean Clements in the fall also experiences an event that ignites an open search for truth of reality and particularly self-understanding. Clements, like Rubashoff, is convinced that he is an honorable man and on the side of justice. He states that his conviction was enough to satisfy his conscience. Yet when he hears the sound of a woman falling into a river from a bridge, he fails to respond. His moral paralysis causes him to re-examine his sense of self-identity. Reflecting on his past, he realizes that the good that he did was calculated and motivated by selfishness rather than a genuine regard for others. When no immediate social or professional gain was evident, he proves to be a moral coward. He reimagines the state of his moral character and his place in the community. In his final lament, he cries out, O oh, young woman, throw yourself into the water again so that I may a second time have the chance of saving us both. In both the case of Rubashoff and Clements, a desperate dying scream stirs the imagination to recast the illusion through which reality is perceived. Why is a historical abstraction problematical? In his essay, Wisdom and the Magic of the Extreme, a Meditation, Vogelin explains the disordering effect of a historical thinking and politics. He acknowledges that activist dreamers and philosophers agree that there are two competing images of reality. One is first reality, 
the truth of reality at its greatest point of insight. The other is second reality, an idyllic dream of reality transformed. Humans live in tension between dream and reality. They are aware to varying degrees of what life is like, that there is a permanent structure of reality that limits the possibilities of justice, truth, beauty, and happiness. Life will always be imperfect. These sober realizations are challenged by a type of optimism that promises an escape from imperfection. Dreams of different types provide a way out of the existentially distressing existence of the Maytaxi. They promise a leap out of the Maytaxi. What separates the philosopher from the activist dreamer is that the former recognizes the dream as a temptation, a pernicious illusion, a mirage brought on by the anxiety of metaxic life. The activist dreamer considers the dream to be realistically attainable and something different than first reality. The flaws and injustices of first reality have cause, causes that can be permanently eradicated. American presidents, for example, have promised an end to war, an end to poverty, an end to terrorism, an end to non-democratic nation states, an end to illegal drug use, an end to serious economic crisis. The philosopher recognizes the May Taxi as the permanent state of human existence in history. The dream is attractive and enticing, but it is rejected as a diversion from the difficult work of ordering the soul and society to tolerable degrees. The activist dreamer aims to transform the structure of reality. When he acts, he expects such action to form the first reality into conformity with the second reality of his dreams. The activist dreamer imagines himself as a magician who can transfigure the nature of things. He is engaging in magical politics. Neither the expense of spirit and intellect in the elaboration of the dreams nor the expense of blood and money in the attempts of realizing them have transfigured reality. The waves of transfiguring acts the world wars to end war, the totalitarian regimes, and the famous liberations have so obviously not abolished the miseries of imperfection that counterwaves of disillusionment begin to rise among the various sorcerers' apprentices. Nor have the abstractions of natural rights and their antecedent ahistorical state of nature changed metaxic life. The UN Declaration of Human Rights is like a script to the activist dreamer's idyllic second reality. Professions of universal rights are not the cause of free societies. As Vogelin explains, if the social reality proposed, presupposed by the Constitution exists, then the written Constitution functions including legal rights. If it does not exist, then de facto modes of conduct will result that deviate very strikingly from what is foreseen in the written project. Edward Bellamy's Looking Backward illustrates Vogelin's point about activist dreamers' belief that first reality can be transformed by gnosis, secret knowledge, and power. There are a few key characteristics of Bellamy's progressive imagination, which is to say that he makes assumptions about human nature, society, and the possibilities of politics. In looking backward, Bellamy creates a utopian American society that is the consequence of a century of reform. Julian West, who has slept from 1888 to 2000, awakens to find the city of Boston, the United States, and the world radically transformed. 
Dr. Leedy spends great time and care explaining to West how the transformation occurred and why it is superior to what it replaced. The new society has among its features universal and free education and national service that is fulfilled as part of a national industrial army. Individuals serve for three years during which they are trained and given the opportunity to see, seek what occupation is desirable. There is a separate industrial army for women suited to their physical powers. They keep working even when they get married but leave to bear children. At 45 years of age, everyone except the select few retire. There is no money, no unemployment, no war, no international conflict, and no real crime. How can it be that nearly all crime has been eliminated? Dr. Leedy explains to West that in your day, fully 19 twentieths of the crime, using the word broadly to include all sorts of misdemeanors, resulted from the inequality in the possessions of individuals. Want tempted the poor, lust of greater gains, or the desire to preserve former games, gains tempted the well-to-do. Directly or indirectly, the desire for money, which then meant every good thing, was the motive of all this crime. The taproot of a vast poison growth which the machinery of law, courts, and police could barely prevent from choking your civilization outright. To reach a more egalitarian distribution of wealth and thus eliminate the source of crime, products are distributed by the nation directly to consumers. There are no retailers. There is no commercialization of goods, no marketing, no economic competition. Each person receives a yearly credit card, which gives them adequate purchasing power for both necessities and luxuries. All institutions are designed to foster egalitarianism. What is it that accounts for this great transformation? In a sermon given by Mr. Barton, he uses the metaphor of a rose bush planted in a swamp, which is ugly, bears very little flowers, is diseased. And it isn't until the society figures out that the rose bush needs to be transplanted into conditions that will foster its flourishing. This is Bellamy's way of talking about the very transformation of human nature. If the conditions of society, the institutions of society are like the swamp, the plant is not healthy and does not grow to its greatest potential. But in the right circumstances, it does exactly that. The consequences of this transformation are especially interesting when Mr. Barton claims the following. For the first time since the creation, every man stood up straight before God, echoing, in a way, Karl Marx. The fear of want and the lust of gain became its extinct motives when abundance was assured to all and immoderate possessions made impossible of attainment. There were no more beggars, no almoners. Equity left charity without an occupation. The Ten Commandments became well nigh obsolete in a world where there was no temptation to theft, no occasion to lie, either for fear or favor, no room for envy where all were equal, and little provocation to violence where men were disarmed of power to injure one another. Humanity's ancient dream of liberty, equality, and fraternity mocked by so many ages, at last was realized. 
There is something odd about Bellamy's story. Writing in the late 19th century, he is attached to some degree to an older Christian worldview. God's desires for man matter to Bellamy. And yet, it is difficult to believe how the descendants of Adam and Eve, who wanted for nothing and yet sinned, could in the 20th century want for nothing and not sin. Likewise, why would economic equality as it exists in Bellamy's utopia, rid the world of moral problems like marital infidelity, crimes of passion, and mere greed and lust. Does it make sense that sexual lust for others would be eliminated by a regular monthly income? The original sin was a sin of pride, not of want. Here is found a profound difference between the progressive imagination and that of the Christian imagination rooted in history as represented by St. Augustine. Bellamy's portrayal of the human condition is truncated and incomplete. It shares in this regard much with Herbert Butterfield's portrayal of Whig history. It neglects to account for dimensions of human life that are central parts of Augustine's view of man and society. Bellamy suggests that elimination of economic want destroys the very desire to steal. Augustine, however, has a deeper and more complete and historically rich understanding of sin and theft. Humans steal at times or in part because of want, but they also do so for the pleasure of sin itself. As Augustine explains in the Confessions, I willed to commit theft, and I did so not because I was driven to it by any need, unless it were by poverty of justice and dislike of it, and by a glut of evil doing. For I stole a thing of which I had plenty of my own and of much better quality. Nor did I wish to enjoy that thing which I desired to gain by theft, but rather to enjoy the actual theft and the sin of theft. He recounts an episode when in his youth he and a band of bad youngsters stole pears and threw them to pigs. We did this, he confesses, to do what pleased us for the reason that it was forbidden. I sought nothing from the shameful deed but shame itself. There is a perversion of good in sin for which Bellamy does not account. Economics cannot explain the disparate complexity of sin. Bellamy fails to account for the desire to sin, for the pleasure of sin. He also fails to consider the need for conversion, inspired by grace. Augustine is well aware that turning away from sin is a painful and trying process that requires introspection and attention to the inner life. Bellamy's utopia develops without any transformation of the inner life. No moral effort. Because the cause of evil lies outside the soul, the remedy for social ills is political, not spiritual work. In short, Bellamy, like many social justice advocates, substitutes public policy and institutional reform for spiritual work. Vogelin is insistent that truth is not an ultimate piece of information, but reality itself becoming luminous in the events of experience and imaginative symbolization. Humans never attain absolute truth because the quest for truth is surrounded by the divine mystery of the reality in which it occurs. The ground of being can pull the philosopher toward it, 
but it withdraws as the philosopher advances toward it. Human understanding of truth, like metaxic life itself, is limited. It is difficult to accept the permanence of the search for truth and the limited extent of human understanding of reality. Justice, as well as knowledge, is imperfect. The best that humans can hope for in historical life is what Russell Kirk called a tolerable civil social order. A philosophically conservative disposition is difficult to maintain in an age that promises unlimited progress. The rapid growth of technology and science in the modern world suggests to some that philosophical and moral limits can be transgressed. Yet technology is incapable of changing the constitution of being. So what is there to be said about the process, prospects for restoring historical scholarship and a historically based politics? Just a few short comments. We live in an age of historical, of ahistorical abstraction. Restoration of historical consciousness and historical imagination is difficult in an age of ideology. Our educational institutions are losing touch with the centrality of history in school curricula. We are inundated with romantic visions of life that create one or another second reality. All, however, is not lost. A significant number of first-rate historians have contributed to our understanding of historical existence. Vogelin, John Lukash, Herbert Butterfield, Forrest MacDonald, Daniel Borstein, Walter McDougall are just a few of the scholars whose books and articles provide a wealth of material to reorient historical consciousness. Hope lies in the existence of reading, writing, and intellectual fellowship that serves as resistance to a historical abstraction and ideological simplification, which is exactly what we're doing at this conference. There is a wonderful story told by Bill McKibben in one of the editions of E.F. Schumacher's Small is Beautiful. McKibben had never heard of Schumacher and went to see him speak. He was frustrated by Schumacher's failure to provide solutions to many of the problems of the modern world. When he pressed Schumacher in the question and answer period for solutions, Schumacher responded, plant a tree. At the time, McKibben didn't see the relevance of planting a tree to solving the world's problems but he eventually understood the power of the suggestion in terms of scale. What an individual can realistically do, and that responsibility is, a, is in a local place, is to a local place. And in terms of community, a tree will benefit future generations and link them with past generations. In the spirit of Schumacher, I suggest that a solution to the problem of ahistorical thinking and ideology is to read a good work of history by Eric Vogelin or John Lukash or any of the other wonderful historians that I have mentioned. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for your lecture. Um, our first question was, in terms of the imagination and the compelling nature of the second reality that really seems to be capturing the attention of a lot of people, particularly in the general public of our generation, how do we recapture that excitement for historical tradition in the first reality? Good question. So how do you combat the attractiveness of a historical ideological thinking which promises things that historical thinking can't promise in one sense. And I'll give you a two-part answer to it. One is, I think that it's important that historical thinking uh, be as emotionally intensive as a historical thinking. There is, in the drama of history, instances 
when human beings have accomplished great things that should be enough for most people. I'm just going to give you one quick example, maybe two. I'm going to give you two quick examples. <laughs> one is George Washington putting down the Newburgh conspiracy. George Washington was a flawed man, but a great man. And there was a time in America when his portrait hung in every schoolhouse in the land. And he has all but disappeared from the walls in our, our schoolhouses and uh, in our imaginations. But one of the things that was so wonderful about Washington is that he embodied the kind of character that was necessary to make Republican government work. And at the end of the American Revolution, when a group of officers were conspiring to overthrow the civilian government and place all power in Washington's hands, engage in a military coup, Washington goes to Newburgh and he puts down that conspiracy and you know, reports what's apocryphal and what isn't, I don't know exactly, is that he uh, gets up in front of those officers and he pulls a prepared statement out of his pocket and he says to the soldiers, please excuse me, I have not only grown gray in the service of my country but also blind. And he pulls out a pair of glasses and most people have never seen him with spectacles on. And he reads the statement which essentially says something to the effect, if you go through with this you will destroy everything that we fought for. That's a remarkable achievement. Right? The guy gave up power. He, he gave up power when he was president. Can you imagine an American president today saying, no, I'm not running for another term of office? It's just that disposition was um, highly remarkable. The life of George Washington, there are flaws to Ron Chernow's biography of Washington, but on the whole, it's pretty solid. Same with his biography of Hamilton. That's good history to read those things to get a sense for what these men were like. And it's historically rich and not, for the most part, ideological. So I would match the intensity, emotional intensity of ideology with the emotional intensity of the drama of history. Read John Lukash's books about Churchill and Hitler and Stalin and the Second World War. The second quick thing that I'll do, maybe that first one wasn't so quick, is uh, recommend the movie to you, Hacksaw Ridge. Right, true story, uh, it's a Mel Gibson movie, and this guy, I guess he's a private, Private Dawes, uh, is a conscientious objector, a pacifist, he won't carry a gun, and what he accomplishes, especially the way it's portrayed in that movie, is far, far beyond what most of us are capable of. And I will tell you that when I watched that movie, I wept. And you know why I wept? because I realized that I wasn't as great a man as he was. That, those sorts of experiences where you lift someone up who deserves to be lifted up, because even though they're flawless, they are an example worth emulating. Call it greatness, call it virtue, whatever you want to call it. But what we have to do, I think, is challenge people to rise to that level. But it's only done, and this to me is a key difference between the true historians and the false historians of ideology, is there's great moral effort and virtue required to accomplish that level of Washington and Dow's and others. And ideology just requires commitment to some romantic ideas. Thank Wonderful you. question. Uh, thank you for your lecture. It was very insightful. Um, our table came up with the question that uh, a lot of the thinkers and the authors that you spoke about came to their conclusions after having very deep and life-changing personal experiences with totalitarianism uh, and in an age where the atrocities of the 20th century are fading uh, in the memories of Americans and, and most people in the West, how do we encourage people to come to the same conclusions without going through the cycle of building up totalitarianism and then experiencing uh, the suffering that comes along with it. Professor McClay last night, you may remember, addressed this very problem because the historian, and historians aren't the only one, but they recall things to memory. 
that's part of the job of good history and historians. And it's part of what Vogelin was doing. He would often use the word anamnesis, to recall to memory. One of the biggest problems we face in learning from history is forgetfulness. Um, so uh, think about the comments I made about reconstituting things. Uh, y yes, memories can fade, and we don't want to keep going back to the same well all the time and dwelling on certain things. There are new experiences or newer experiences in history that can be used to illustrate similar sort of points. But I think you first of all, first and foremost, have to know what they are. You, you have to know history, and the, one of the biggest problems we face right now in schools, for example, is we don't teach history anymore. And we often teach ideology instead of history. You know, it's all this race, class, and gender crap. But true history, the drama of history, is what needs to be taught in schools. It's what people need to read. It's what college students need to study. And as core curriculums have dwindled, that becomes a greater and greater problem. But putting good history in front of people that will um, kind of attune them to the drama of history, whether it's totalitarianism or something else, I think is the, is the right approach. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, what's the right way to read history or to study history or discuss history that, um, that combats or resists the temptation to fall into these type of progressive historical narratives? or the, the view of history as an endless uh, chain of progressive uh, advancements and achievements. Or on the flip side, flip side of that, you can also have this kind of nihilistic view of history, or that there's a constant nihilism running through it. Man, if I had the answer to that question, I would be a much more important man than I am. <laughs> but I will say this, there, there are two things that are important to inoculate people from ideology. One is intellectual and the other is spiritual or existential. Because part of what attracts people to ideology is um, what Vogelin calls pneumopathology. It's a spiritual sickness and it prepares them. It creates an appetite for ideology. And so you can't simply teach people anti-ideology. Any college professor will tell you, you run into students all the time. You can't teach virtue. You can't teach truth in one sense if people aren't open to it. Rational discussion requires certain existential prerequisites. So I would simply say, from the perspective of a college professor, you have to do things to earn the trust of your students so that they're at least open to what it is that you're teaching. And sometimes that's possible and sometimes that's not possible. You cannot lose a lot of sleep when it's impossible. You have to move on to what is possible. And when you encounter students who you can, you know, Plato uses the language in the allegory of the cave of periagoge, you know, turning around, opening of souls. That's really what we're talking about here. And you can do that, I think, um, in a personal relationship more than you can even do it intellectually. It's possible intellectually, but intellectual work alone isn't enough. So it's a you know a case by case small thing. We're not talking about a great awakening or a tent and thousands of people coming and then they're going to say, oh my gosh, ideology is bad. I'm going to go read Vogelin. You know that that's <laughs> that's just not going to happen. But on a case by case basis, you know you you fight the war where you are in the trench that you're in, and you do the best that you can with that. Thank you. Our table find, found your lecture very thought-provoking, and our question was, um, in your discussion of the first and second reality, um, it seems that second reality is very natural to mankind, but it's utopian and therefore dangerous idealism. So is there a place for the second perspective to be used within the first reality? I'm trying to wrap my head around your question. Do you mean a place for second reality? Let me use different language. Either doxa, untruth, lie. 
Is there a place for lies in the search for truth? I would say yes, if you mean by that as an illustration of what's not true, but not, no, let me take a couple steps back and ask the question a different way. Is there a place for romanticism in first reality? Is there a good form of romanticism? And I would say yes, there is a good form of romanticism. The, the film that I just recommended, Hacksaw Ridge, is a romantic film. The story that I told about Washington putting down the Newburgh conspiracy is a romantic sort of story, right? It pulls at our heartstrings in part. It engenders certain emotions that lead to a different place than ideological romanticism. So if that's what you mean, I would say, sure, Burke is a romantic in one sense. I mean, just read the way he writes. He's, he's, he appeals to more than reason. He appeals to things that are imaginative and emotional, but different than, say, someone like Rousseau. That was our question. Thank yeah. you. Um, since progressivism has been hegemonic in American society for about a century, uh, it is no longer for, sufficient for conservatives to try and reconstruct a past reality. So how do conservatives project an alternative vision for the future without falling prey to the magical politics of the activist dreamer? So how do you combat progressivism? Uh, yes, and how do we have future visions? <laughs> like a future vision of society without mm. falling prey to the Nazis. Right, so one of the things that conservatives often have to overcome is well, you're so pessimistic. And, but conservatism is only pessimistic if you're an idealist. So of course, if somebody is saying, I can make all evil go away, or some particular evil, and you say, no, you can't, of course you're going to appear more pessimistic. So um, again, I, I would go back to a comment I made earlier, and that is there are things that we can point to that are, in fact, realistic, that are real accomplishments of history. You know, the creation of the American Constitution, something that I've spent a professional lifetime teaching and writing about, is, I think, one of those great accomplishments. And it can be used, I think, to demonstrate that political life, for example, isn't all disorder and chaos and injustice, that actually a great deal of good can be done, has been done in the American experience by the creation of the American constitutional order. So I, I would recommend picking out things like that, learning them thoroughly, and teaching them, talking about them in a way that can demonstrate to people that these are real, not just possible, but they're real accomplishments. They happened. And the stuff that these ideologues are talking about over here are not only impossible, but the attempt to pursue them leads to great evil. Right? The Jacobin slogan of liberty, equality, and fraternity, those are horrible ideas, pernicious ideas. And you have to get people to see that. Just because it sounds good to your romantic ideological ears doesn't make it good. Well, how do we know that? What are the fruits of those ideas? So Professor McClay mentioned um, ideas have consequences, right? Use that. Ideas have consequences. What are the consequences of these nice, romantic-sounding ideas? What are the consequences of Marx's notion that if we just get rid of one class of people, we will have this utopia? Well, the consequences are the systematic murder of tens and tens of millions of innocent human beings. Is that what you're for? You know, that's what I ask people who express those ideological ideas and let them try and talk their way out of, well, that's not what I'm talking about. You know, show me in history examples of what you're talking about. And if you can't show me, then you're in all likelihood talking about something that isn't real and isn't possible. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for the lecture, Dr. Federici. You are um, welcome. So our table was talking about um, the fact that conservatives generally agree 
that the social influence of a better family community, good family, good community, um, will lead and, and encourage the flourishing of individuals. So what's the difference between that sort of social influence and the sort of social engineering that you suggested is harmful in Bellamy's Rosebush? The difference between good families and communities and what Bellamy is doing in the Rosebush? Okay, the big difference is that Bellamy is operating in the domain of social justice, meaning it's all about external things. External to what? External to the soul and the character of human beings. So what do you do? Where's the focus? Reorganizing society. What is Black Lives Matter or any of these other social justice movements? What are they all about? Let's reorganize society. Let's defund the police. Let's get rid of the nuclear family, whatever it is. It's a restructuring of the organization of society, a restructuring of institutions. There is no moral work required to accomplish the great things of these social justice movements. What, what's the other side? The other side is there is no substitute for the hard work of ordering the soul. So even when you say something like, well, we need good families and strong families, I don't know about your experience in family life, but mine is, it's hard. I've been married for, I don't know, 32, 33 years, something like that. Hardest thing I've ever done. You, you giggle because you probably still have a romantic view of marriage, but let me tell you something. <laughs> Three decades plus of marriage with the same person, raising kids, going through you know, financial turmoil, taking care of your elderly parents, having a sick child, having somebody in your family die, none of that is easy. That's really, really hard stuff to do it and maintain your dignity. It is enough, it's a full plate for most human beings, never mind saving the world. So part of what it means to be a conservative is to be more attached to what Burke calls the little platoons, those places where we live, we sleep, we eat, and we breathe, and to put our energy and focus into those places. We live in a society where all the talk, even on the political right for the most part, is about these distant things. It's a different version of social justice than on the political left but it's not focus on the life of the soul. So I would say that is the biggest difference in the two things. Uh, Buddhism has a concept called apamata. Apamata means ethical work, moral work. And T.S. Eliot has a poem, Choruses from the Rock, in which he says that um, these progressive reformers, they try to reform society without reforming the individual. And that, I think, kind of captures the problem exactly. So when I hear my colleagues in the university or even students talking about all this good that can be done in society, I say to them, are you really suggesting that you can eradicate war and crime and all these things, but no one has to exert any moral effort? What examples do you have historically of something like that happening? The moral life is central to these problems. And it happens in the small platoons. And that's where the focus should be, in my view. That's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, he, he comes up to the podium with a swagger. <laughs> So in your lecture, you spoke of the philosopher King who kind of flirts with the second reality, but also of like the activist dreamer who becomes intoxicated in it. And I believe they're kind of, you know, looking to achieve the same ends, with like, you know, justice, lessening the suffering of man. How do we flirt with the second reality without becoming drunk in it? Uh, prayer, reflection, the reading of good books, uh, hang around with the right sort of people who are not drunk with crazy ideological ideas. You know, you have to keep your feet on the ground. You have to maintain focus on the life of the soul. So I'll relate it to the last comment that I made from the previous question. 
The people over here in the social justice mov movements, their focus, their concentration is all on these external things and not on the life of the soul. So how do you maintain your focus on the life of the soul? I'm going to give you just one little thing that I do every day. And my apologies to those of you who would find this offensive. Every time I wash my hands, I say a Hail Mary. And I got the idea from the pandemic when people said, sing the happy birthday song when you wash your hands, and then you know you're washing them for the right amount of time. And I'm like, why do I want to waste my time singing the happy birthday song? That's, <laughs> I don't like birthdays anymore at my age, and you know, I want to be reminded of them. So I got the idea that I would just say a prayer as I wash my hands, because we wash our hands several times a day. And what does it do? In a moment when normally I'm not focused on my soul and my inner life, I am now getting in the habit of doing it. And I mean focusing, not just repeating the words of the prayer because it's only habit, but because I'm thinking about the meaning of the prayer and the state of my soul. Reminding myself as I wash my hands that I've been baptized because I have original sin and that I'm still sinful, right? That, that there's probably nothing better than we can do than reminding ourselves that we suffer from original sin. We are imperfect and imperfectible in this world. These guys are saying something quite different over there. Remind yourself. That's why um, I'm a Catholic Christian and you go into a good Catholic church and you are reminded of death. I live down the street in Tennessee from a mega church that has 8,000 members. And on Good Friday, they have hot air balloons and colorful flags and stuff. On the day when human beings crucified Christ, it just doesn't seem appropriate to me. And my youngest daughter at one point said, they have balloons. They have colorful flags. They have food trucks. That's a, why are we going to the church where they talk about all this gloomy stuff? And I said, because the job of the church, first and foremost, is to prepare you for death. What more do you want than that? And she said, I want the food trucks and I want the balloons. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Hi, thank you so much for the lecture. Um, so I kind of have two questions and one. Um, how can you explain, how can one explain the dangers of second reality without um, using a Judeo-Christian perspective on original sin? And another dimension to this is how do you persuade uh, people who believe in a Judeo-Christian framework but identify as progressive, um, those people who hold to second reality abstractions but justify them on the basis of social justice and on the basis that... Um, that is working at the radical call of Christ to marginalized communities. How do you convince those people um, to, to see, I guess, the first principles? OK, so the first question is, uh, how do you combat second reality without using the Judeo-Christian tradition? Classical philosophy, I mean, I did that in part. Right, Metaxi is a, a Greek word that comes from Plato. There's lots there in Plato and Aristotle alone. There's stuff in Cicero. Classical philosophy, even the Stoics, uh, can provide you with sufficient intellectual and experiential ammunition with which to combat ideology. There are more contemporary thinkers who, by the early 20th century, kind of understood that religion, especially Judeo-Christianity had lost its authority in the West. And so appeals to it were likely to fall on deaf ears. And so you, you have to use something else. Uh, Irving Babbitt, who I mentioned, does that. His book, Democracy and Leadership, is a good example of that. He mentions religion, but it's not an argument based on religion. Even Vogelin, even though he's heavily steeped in many re respects in the Christian tradition, there's a lot in there that is all sort of ancient philosophy and other things that aren't Christian. He even talks about um, other civilizations and the, and the search and quest for order. So your second question has to do with how do you convince people who are Christians who are kind of infected with second reality? Yeah. 
I mean, that's a hard one. I do that for a living. And I'll just go back to what I said, that I don't think that intellectual argument alone gets the job done. I think somehow it's like the example of uh, Robeshoff that I used from Darkness at Noon. How, how do you get someone like that <clears throat> who's a hardened ideologue, who's been part of a revolutionary movement to see the errors of their ways? He sees it on his own. But because <clears throat> the truth has been represented to him in a rather dramatic form, that kind of forces him to open his soul. But I don't think that there's anything short of um, opening the soul. I mean, you can make arguments, you can present evidence, but at some point, you, you have to reach people where it matters most, which is in that, that existential domain. And you do that with, by building trust um, and by putting things in their hands that will hopefully you know, pry them open a little bit to at least hear more of what's there. Good, good powerful literature, I think, can do that better than systematic philosophy. So a good, you know, a good novel is capable of doing that. The Fall, I like that Camus novel, is a good one. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Um, how do we discern which facets of life are a part of the human condition and which of them are worth trying to change? And how do you communicate human fallibility to an unbelieving public mass? What was the, sec the first word used there? What, the first part of this question? Um, how, how do we discern which facets of life are a part of the human condition? Which of them are worth trying to change? Mm -hmm. Right, so you, we don't want to say to somebody you can't change anything. No improvement or progress is necessary. Well, of course it is. <clears throat> it's, uh, it, it's possible. So how do you distinguish between the changeable and the unchangeable? Well, history itself provides us a guide um, to that, uh, the parameters. So Vogelin would say, in the philosophical life, you come into contact with this, this ground of being, this source of reality itself, what Plato calls the beyond. The great philosophers are searching for that thing which is the source of order. And it's an, it's an endeavor to get to know that thing, to know it through historical experience. So that your own consciousness, as well as your reason, becomes adapted to it. And so you understand the parameters of the possible and the impossible. But I would say, first and foremost, you take your cues regarding the possible and the impossible from history itself, from knowing history. So the thing that does not support these ideological endeavors is the fact that they never come true. The, the, the transformation of being itself, the transformation of the Maytaxi, never happens. And in fact, efforts to change it result in great tragedy great injustices. Things get worse, not better. Using examples like that to illustrate, and then using the examples on the other side, some of which I've given before, which have to do with great things can be accomplished, have been accomplished in history. So what do we know about the people who accomplished them? Well, one thing is we know that they're imperfect. So Washington, Washington who I mentioned as a great man, was also a slaveholder. We're reminded of that all the time now. All of these great figures in history have their flaws, and yet they still can accomplish a degree of good. And orienting yourself to kind of the parameters of what is possible, it's harder doing that looking forward. You know, is it possible to have an unemployment rate that is permanently below 3%? I don't know whether it is or it isn't possible. I know that it's impossible to get everybody to work all the time because some people just don't want to work, whether jobs are available or they're not available. So in the realm of public policy, what's possible is different than in the realm of um, sort of human character and human accomplishment.
but I would take as the boundaries the greatest things that human civilization has produced. You know, think about something like art, music, poetry, literature. Those are, you know, the Iliad and Odyssey were mentioned. Those are remarkable achievements. Remarkable achievements. So is it possible to do something like that? Yes. Is it rare? Extremely rare. So just because it's possible doesn't even mean that it will be accomplished if it has been accomplished historically. But uh, Mrs. Gillen, my fifth grade teacher, used to say when we would do things wrong, let your conscience be your guide. I will echo her, but I'll say let history be your guide. Thank you. <laughs>